Arratxaldeon guztioik, la verdad es que esperábamos que esta sala iba a estar totalmente llena. Además, hemos trabajado desde la facultad para que fuera así, pero bueno, parece que las cosas no lo hemos hecho tan bien como debiéramos hacerlas y estamos en esta situación. Porque creo que una de las, pers las personas que nos va a dar la charla es una persona muy importante en este mundo del cambio climático y creo que merece que, merece que tenga audiencia. De todas formas, estoy seguro y espero que mañana en la facultad pues, tengamos más asistencia. Bueno, esan beharra daukat, esan beharra daukat, e, zientzia eta teknologia fakultateak asmoa zuela, asmoa zuela, ba, uendalak, da, pandemia, pandemia hasi aurretik, ba, ikerketa jardunaldiak egitea. Ezin, egin, ezin izan ziren egin pandemia gatik, eta atzeratu egin ziren. Baina, pensatu genuen, klima aldaketaren jardunaldiak obezela, bera, ibo de boer, hemen dugun izlaria gurekin edukita. Eta horregatik eh, atzeratu genuen, jardun, atzeratu genituen jardunaldibek bera ona etartzeko aukera izan arte. Eta hau da aukera. Eta horrekin esaten dut, horrekin esaten dut, ba, jardunaldiak detxu genion orduan aldaketan klimatikoaren eguna. Pero la verdad es que al final, después del cambio, eh, será, el día del cambio climático serán dos días. Uno, esta charla que nos dará el profesor Ivo de Boer, y mañana en la Facultad de Ciencia y Tecnología tendremos dos mesas redondas en las que investigadores y profesores de la, de la, particularmente de nuestra facultad y del BC3 nos enseñarán el trabajo que se está haciendo y cuál es la situación del cambio climático y cuáles son las aportaciones que se hacen desde la propia facultad. La primera será a las nueve y media, mejor dicho, nueve cuarenta, será sobre las soluciones tecnológicas y la segunda será a las eh, una hora más tarde, porque las mesas redondas serán de una hora, y la siguiente será a las eh, 10.50, que será sobre la situación medio, medioambiental. Y después, una vez terminadas esto, tendremos un, un descanso de media hora y el profesor Ivo de Boer responderá a todas las dudas que surjan en esas mesas redondas y al mismo tiempo dar las contribuciones desde su pensamiento respecto a la solución del cambio climático. Eta orain, Itza emango diot, ba, Ibo de Boer aurkeztuko de duenari, eta horretarako itza emango diot, natura ondare eta klima aldaketako zuzendariri. Klima aldaketako zuzendaria da Adolfo Uriarte doktorea, gure fakultateko ikaslea izan dakoa, eta berari emango diot itza, ba, Ibo de Boer aurkeztu dezan. Eskarrik asko, Adolfo. Eskerrik asko, Fernando, y arratzaldeon guztioi. Uh, good evening. Uh, por razones de traducción y para que Ivo también nos entienda, voy a hacer la presentación de él en inglés. Espero que, bueno, como luego la presentación es inglés, we will continue, I will continue in English. Well, before introducing, introducing our guest speaker, I would like to say that the Basque Country has been a pioneer in establishing a long-term climate strategy. We started already in 2015, actually before the agreement, the Paris Agreement, we had all already approved our strategy, but we are aware that we still need to accelerate decarbonization. We need to act as soon as possible. In these, uh, these days, it is being visualized. You have been hearing about COP. Sorry, I'm going to take this out. That we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that we have to accelerate the changes in our territory so to, to adapt to climate change. And we need to increase climate financing. Definitely, we need more money and to, to try to boost all these opportunities that will arise from European funds, such as the generation, next generations, but as well our own funds that we are committed to. Uh, the Basque government has been aware of this great challenge and urgency, and already in 2019 we signed the Institutional Declaration of Climate Emergen Emer Emergency with the commitment to move to towards a more resilient and climate, and climate neutral society by 2050. We have recently approved an energy transition and climate change plan that will last until 2024, and we are actually drafting an energy transition and climate change law that we will hopefully 
uh, have uh, finalized by spring next year. This, the, the main aims of our, of our law is to achieve climate neutrality by, of the Basque country so that there is no net, grass, net, net, net greenhouse gas emissions in that uh, in, by 2050. And definitely we have to increase as well the resilience of the Basque country to climate change. We have need to promote the carbonization and we have to take advantage of all the opportunities of the energy transition process, as I said before, to boost technological and business de development capabilities. We started also in 2015 to develop different uh, funding programs, like our Climatech program, where we, where we are, foster, we are uh, developing innovation projects for climate action, and we are as well developing local climate eco-innovation projects, and we are transferring all this knowledge and, uh, into projects that are being carried out by our Basque municipalities. We are as well developing a very, very uh, ambitious Urban Clima 2050 live program where with more than 20 million euros that are going to be invested in the next five years. And definitely with this live Urban Clima project with, is trying to put into action all the knowledge that we have already in the, in the, govern, in, in, in the Basque country and put into action, make, make it really become something tangible. But we still have many challenges ahead, and to give us some light, we have today Professor Ivo de Boer. Ivo de Boer was appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, as Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention of climate change, on Climate Change in 2006. And he thereafter left the United Nations in 2010 to join the International Advisory Group, KPMG, as a global advisor on climate and sustainability. Prior to joining the UNFCCC, Mr. De Boer had various positions in the Netherlands administration. Among others, he served as Deputy Director General of Environment, De Deputy Director of Environmental Protection and as head of the Department of Climate Change. Mr. De Boer, in De Boer's involvement in climate change policies began in 1994 he helped pre to prepare the European Union's position in the run-up of the negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol, assisted the design of the international sharing of the European Union's responsibility, and led several delegations to the UNFCCC negotiations. He has always actively sought broad stakeholder participation in the issue of climate change. Mr. De Boer has been president of the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations uh, Framework Convention of Climate Change and vice chairman of the Commission on Sustainable De Development. At the time of his appointment, he was a member of the China Council of International Cooperation and Environmental, and environment on environmental Development, the Office of the Environmental Policy Commitment, uh, sorry, Committee of the Organization of, of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Advisory Group of the World Bank's Carbon Fund for Community Development, and the, and the Board of Directors of the Clean Air Policy Center. With such a CV, of course, we are looking forward to his presentation. And we can say that we can hardly find a person that with such a background and experience in the fight against climate change. So for, for us and for me personally, I believe this is a huge opportunity to listen to what Professor De Boer is going to tell us. Thank you very much.
Okay. Ah, now it's better. Now you can. <laughs> okay, I won't repeat what I just said. I thought before I, I start on my, my presentation, we would begin with a little bit of physical exercise. Uh, and don't worry, you only have to move one arm. Because I want to ask you, I want to ask you four questions, just to get a bit of an impression of the, of the mood in the room. And my first question is, if you think that climate change is one of the most critical issues facing us at this moment in time, please raise your hand. Okay, I think that's almost, ah, <laughs> now it's, it's pretty much everyone. All right, my second question is, and it doesn't apply to the, to the Basque country, but in general, if you feel that politicians are not doing enough to address climate change, please raise your hand again. Okay. That's almost everyone as well. My third question is, do you believe that we have the solutions, the technical solutions, the technological solutions today that would actually allow us to address climate change if we were serious about it? If you feel that we have most of the technological solutions today, please raise your hand again. Okay, so that's far fewer people. So you believe the issue is important, you believe the politicians are doing enough, but you still feel we need to make progress in terms of the technologies um, that we will be necessary. Which takes me to the fourth and final question, and it's a much more personal question, and it's the question, would you be willing to make a personal financial sacrifice in terms of your income or your taxes to ensure that we can pay for the technology that we need and that we price um, pollution properly. So the fourth and final question is, if you feel that you're willing to make a personal financial sacrifice to address climate change, please raise your hand again. Okay, that's the vast majority of, of, of people as well. Um, so that's interesting. I think that the, the view that you've expressed and the, the position that this room is, is, taken, is taking is, is pretty much reflective of how most Europeans feel about climate change as an issue, the need to take action, the lack of political will, where we stand on technology and around willingness to pay. But one of the things that I want to address in talking to you this evening, and I think it's a critical issue, is how does the rest of the world feel about that? I think we have a tendency, I certainly have a tendency myself to very much look at the world through European glasses, to believe that the things that I feel strongly about are shared with the rest of humanity, but that is not the case. And in a world where we have to address the solution, the issue of the challenge of climate change together, it is really critically important to understand how different parts of the world feel about this issue, how different communities feel about this issue because that understanding is critical in terms of, of getting us to a solution. But let me get back to what I promised uh, to talk about and begin by saying a few words in terms of, of where we stand at the moment. In, in the introduction that was made just now, it was mentioned that I got into the issue of climate change in, in 1994. And although we'd been researching climate change for a very long time, actually the science at that moment in time was very uncertain. There's a, a big international body called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which basically drives the scientific message that underpins the political negotiations. And when I got into the subject of climate change in 1994, the scientists were still very uncertain in terms of the message that they were conveying. Uh, and at that time, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with its second report. They've just published their sixth report. They came out with the second, and in that report was a sentence which must have been written by a lawyer, not by a scientist. 
I wonder how you're going to do on the interpretation of this, but this, the, the sentence actually was, the balance of evidence suggests discernible human influence on climate change. So the balance of evidence suggests discernible human influence. A very carefully formulated sentence. And that very carefully formulated sentence then found its reflection in the politics of, uh, of that time, of 1994. And where we are today is that we've come enormously far in terms of the science. We have a much better understanding of the origins of climate change in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. We have a much better understanding of the impacts of, uh, of, of climate change. Um, so basically, we're at a moment in time, and that I think led to some very important political decisions in, in Paris just a few years ago, where science is telling us very clearly that climate change is real, that we're causing climate change, and that climate change is beginning to run out of control. So you would think that if there is that clear a message from the scientific community, that we would be seeing an appropriate response from politics. But what we are in fact seeing is that emissions of greenhouse gases globally today are higher than they've ever been before. And what we're also seeing is that although many had hoped that the COVID pandemic would be an opportunity to begin to change our economic direction, that actually emissions have rebounded after the COVID crisis and that they are now at the same levels that they were before we got into this emergency. So emissions are not reflecting um, what science is telling us needs to happen. At the, at the climate change conference in, in Paris in 2015, governments made a commitment to keep average global temperature increase below one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. It's a, it's a very complicated, very complicated sentence. Is there anybody in the room that does not know where that one and a half degrees comes from um, or doesn't know exactly what it means? I'm happy to explain it if there's anybody, so feel free to raise your hand, okay. Okay, the, the, the scientific community basically concluded in, in all of its assessments that if we want to avoid dangerous human interference with the climate system, which is what the, the whole regime is actually about, that we need to keep temperature increase below two degrees centigrade or if possible below one and a half degrees um, centigrade above pre-industrial levels. And the reason for that two degrees or one and a half degrees is that if you move beyond that temperature increase, you will need to see impacts which you can actually call dangerous. So the feeling was that if we manage to keep the temperature increase below that, then extreme weather events, floods, droughts will be severe, but they will still be manageable. And underpinning the one and a half degrees centigrade is also the notion that, that ecosystems need time to adapt to a temperature increase. So basically, if you say we want to limit temperature increase below two degrees centigrade, it means that you're going to see a temperature increase of one-tenth of a degree per decade. And that is a speed of change to which many ecosystems can still adapt. So basically, the one and a half and two degrees were a translation of a scientific message into the kind of political response that, uh, that you need. And this clock, which is going to be running, continue running up here, is a clock that tells you how much time we have left to get emissions under control, to get emissions below one and a half degrees centigrade, to get emissions going down if we want to avoid that temperature increase. So we're actually in the situation now where we're only almost eight years or, or seven years and eight months away from the moment when we will no longer be able to avoid 
a temperature increase of more than one and a half degrees unless we manage to get emissions under control. And that, at least to my mind, is, is pretty close. If you look at the pledges that we have at the moment from governments, the promises that we have from governments around the world to reduce emissions, those pledges, those promises, those plans, many of which are for very far away, are for 2050, are not enough to keep us below one and a half degree temperature increase. In fact, assessments coming out, you know there's a big climate conference happening in Glasgow at the moment. The assessment is that the promises that are on the table are probably more like getting us to 1.8, 2 degrees, maybe even over 2 degrees centigrade. So in other words, in terms of the pledges, the promises that we have been made, we don't have enough to avoid dangerous temperature increase. At the same time, we're, and this is I think for the first time in history, in a situation where forests on which we rely very significantly to absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere, are actually emitting more CO2 than they absorb. Partially as a result of forest fires, partially as a result of forest fires which have been caused as a result or which are happening as a result of, of climate change. So the forests which we've been hoping for to absorb more CO2 are actually emitting more in, uh, into the atmosphere um, than they were. And as you've all read in the, the newspapers, as you've seen on television, we are already seeing increasingly severe impacts of climate change around the world. Pretty much more of everything everywhere. If you live in a dry area, you're seeing more drought. If you live in a wet area, you're seeing more floods. Um, we're seeing more extreme weather events. Basically, many of the impacts of, of climate change are beginning to occur already. And we are very close to reaching a number of tipping points which potentially could take climate change out of control. Now, what do I mean by tipping points? As you may be aware, um, most of the Ar Arctic consists of frozen tundra. So that actually means frozen peatlands, which contain a great deal of methane. Methane is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas, much more powerful than CO2. And if the ice in the Arctic melts, which it's beginning to do because of climate change, then that methane would be released into the atmosphere, um, and you would actually get a degree of emissions which we can't get under control anymore with human efforts to, uh, to reduce emissions. And that, for example, can have impacts in terms of, of the Gulf Stream um, ceasing to function properly. Oddly enough, as a consequence of which, you would get an ice age in northern Europe because the Gulf Stream isn't functioning properly anymore. So the situation at the moment, and I'm really not trying to depress you, um, is that the science is much clearer, the political action is not sufficiently strong, and that we're seeing dangerous impacts of climate change already and very close to a number of political tipping points. So that's a bit of where we are in terms of our understanding on, on the science. But what's been happening in terms of the, of the political process? I mentioned earlier that the science in 1994 was not terribly clear, or at least the, the, the scientists did not really feel confident to make very strong pronouncements on, uh, on the issue of climate change and our part of it. But we have been on a series, uh, on a journey of discovery for, for some time. There have been some scientists telling us that, that climate change is real and that we're causing it probably since about the 1950s, but very few. In 1972, there was a very big conference in Stockholm on the human environment, um, which really first brought the issue of climate change to the forefront. And that led in 1992 to the adoption of the, of the Climate Change Convention as the first real political decision on the part of governments from around the world that we need to avoid dangerous climate change as caused by us uh, humans. So that was in 1992, the recognition of that we're causing this problem and that we need to act on it. 
Then in Berlin in 1995, we had another conference, many conferences, one at which it was agreed that since most of the issue of climate change as we know it today is being caused by industrialized countries, that therefore also industrialized countries need to take the lead in terms of reducing emissions. So then we got in 1997 in Kyoto something called the Kyoto Protocol, which was the first international legally binding instrument obliging industrialized countries to reduce their emissions to begin to take us on that pathway uh, of getting emissions down and hopefully closer to the one and a half or, uh, or two degrees. That was followed in 2015 by a big conference, another conference in Paris, where basically countries committed to this goal of one and a half degrees and committed to this year take stock of where we stand in terms of climate change action and increase ambition if we're not on track. And that's exactly what the conference is about that's happening at the moment in Glasgow. So the pur purpose of that conference in Glasgow is to take stock, are countries doing what they've promised, and do we need to increase the level of ambition? Not just in terms of um, reducing emissions, but also in terms of support to developing countries. But as I said, we're not in the situation where emissions are under control. So if so little is happening, or if not is happening, the critical question is, why isn't enough happening? Why are we not taking enough action to address climate change at this moment in time? And I'd like to briefly give 10 answers to, uh, to that question. My first answer, and it's a, it's a quite dramatic one, is, well, let me turn it into a question. Is there anyone in the room that can give me an example of a single country that has achieved prosperity, eradicated poverty, without going through a process of industrialization and associated pollution? I can't give myself a certain, uh, any example. And if I'm correct, or if I'm almost correct, what it basically means is that we are, that we as the rich nations of the world, we as Europeans, are saying we became wealthy as a, as a result of a process of industrialization. Pollution came with that. That has made us wealthy. But now we would like you, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria, to follow a different path, to grow your economies in a green way. We haven't done it, it's never been proven, but please move in that entirely different direction. So one of the reasons why we're not moving sufficiently on climate change is because basically the model that we're proposing hasn't been tested, hasn't been demonstrated, there aren't national level examples that you can follow. Yes, there are examples of cities that are green, there are examples of regions that are green, there are examples of portions of industry that are green. But at the national level, we have no examples to follow. So that makes it a, a very difficult message to convey to, to countries. The second is that, and I think that the, the previous speaker illustrated this, that greenhouse gas emissions are not isolated in one place. Greenhouse gas emissions are part of, of every economic and social activity that we do. They're part of housing, they're part of transport, they're part of agriculture, they're part of manufacturing, they're part of tourism, which basically means that you need to get every section of your economy under control in order to come to grips with this issue. You can't isolate it in a certain place. If I, if I make a comparison with another big environmental challenge which we did manage to address, namely the hole in the ozone layer. We managed to get, I think, that under control significantly because it was a, an issue that was isolated to refrigerants. If you could use different kinds of refrigerants, you would not get the same depletion of the, uh, of the ozone layer. So it was in a way a much simpler issue to address or a much more isolated issue to address than climate change, which has an impact 
on every part of your lives. The, the bus that you take, the car that you drive, the meat that you eat. Meat is an example. Um, it, it, it basically reaches into as every aspect of, of your life. The third reason why I think we are struggling to address the issue is because we have a global economy. Because countries and, and in economies and industries are, are related to each other. Which basically means that if, if we do something here in Europe, or if you do something very aggressive in this region to reduce emissions, and it pushes up the cost of something that you produce, that you are likely to lose competitive advantage to somebody else that's doing the same thing in a different part of the world. For example, one of the big issues that we struggle with in, in my country, in the Netherlands, um, are emissions coming from, uh, from, the, from dairy farming. The, the problem, although part of the issue, is that we have probably one of the most efficient dairy industries in the world. And the concern on the part of dairy farmers is that if they are forced out of business, then basically that industry is going to come back some, somewhere else, probably in a more polluting form. So the fact that we have a global economy means that you can't go it alone, that you basically need all countries or certainly major economies to, uh, to act on this issue, which is why countries keep struggling through this laborious United Nations process of everyone being around the table and everyone trying to achieve uh, a consensus. The, the fourth reason, I think, is that our decision-making processes, our political decision-making processes, are very much in the grips of the economy of the past rather than the economy of the future. What do I mean by that? If in, in my country, if the government talks to industry, it talks to the big steel, aluminium, cement manufacturers, the paint manufacturers, the airline companies, the, the big multinationals that are basically propping up a significant part of our economy. And those are also the high emitting companies that have very little interest actually in a change of direction. So you see that politicians around the world are very reluctant to make decisions that would take the economy in a different direction and act against the number of the vested interests that we, uh, that we have. The, the fifth point, the fifth reason why I think we're struggling to address climate action, and it's related to some of the other ones, is because interests around the world are not the same. Let me take a number, 90 plus percent. The Polish economy relies for more than 90 percent of its energy production on coal. France relies on more than 90% of its energy production on nuclear energy. Saudi Arabia relies for more than 90% of its GDP on selling oil and gas. So here you have three countries, all with something in the 90s, all with fundamentally different interests. And a big problem that's standing in the way of adequate action to address climate change is the fact that Countries are trying to protect their economies. They're trying to find a way forward and that a pathway that you might agree at an international level that works really well for France is not going to work for Poland. And if you really reduce emissions dramatically around the world, Saudi Arabia is not going to be happy about that. So something to bear in mind and something that, that is worrying is how can we um, find ways forward that recognize the different interests of different countries around the world. My sixth point is that it's very easy still at the mo this moment in time to externalize environmental costs, to make sure that you are not responsible for the pollution that you're causing. Um, in, a, in a previous life, when I was working for KPMG, I, I did an analysis of 11 major sectors of the global economy. Uh, steel, cement, pulp and paper, uh, airlines, consumer goods, uh, etc. And ask myself the question, what would happen 
if those sectors of the economy had to fully internalize the environmental cost. So in other words, if a certain amount of pollution is caused in making the shirt that you're wearing, that the industry has to bear the cost of that pollution. And one of the conclusions of that report is that, for example, if the consumer goods industry, the apparel industry, the people that make the clothes that you're wearing, were forced to pay for the pollution that they cause, they would be run out of business, wiped out twice over. So we're still in a situation where major parts of our economy can pass on the cost of pollution to society and doesn't have to internalize that cost. And if we force them to internalize that cost, they would either go out of business or your shirt would be three times as expensive as it is um, today. So we have a big issue around internalization of, uh, of cost. At the same time, and that's my seventh point, um, we are still very much propping up the economy of, of the past. So I talked about earlier about not building back better. But the situation at the moment, for example, is that every year we as the global community spend about six trillion dollars in subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. We don't subsidize the fossil fuel industry because we want to destroy the environment. We subsidize the fossil fuel industry because it means jobs, because it's part of our economy, because it's important. But if you're subsidizing the fossil fuel industry at that amount, it makes it that much more difficult for wind and solar and battery technology to make it into the market. So my seventh reason is that we still have a very unlevel playing field at the moment not only in terms of passing on the cost of pollution to the person responsible, but also in terms of subsidizing the industries of the future and not enough subsidizing the industries of, uh, of the future. My eighth and ninth point are that we still believe that the green solutions are too expensive, that we think they are not affordable, that we are afraid that it would have a major impact on our quality of life, um, and that as a consequence of that, we are somewhat reluctant to vote for, for brave decisions. Um, I remember mentioning to, to you a little while ago that I was speaking to a, a, a Dutch politician not all that long ago, and she said to me, you know, Dutch people are just like chameleons. They're incredibly green, they're incredibly progressive, they care about the environment. But when they go into the voting booth and they close the curtains behind them, they suddenly become dark brown and they're not willing to, uh, to make sacrifices. So we're generally, I think, afraid that the cost is going to be um, too high. And many of us also feel that maybe still this problem is far away, that it's not going to affect us directly. Uh, I remember reading something earlier this week that where somebody asked the question, has that situation actually maybe even been caused in part by Greenpeace? Which you will remember that the Greenpeace image of climate change is this polar bear on a piece of ice very far away. Um, there's no ocean ice, I think, in the Basque region and no polar bears. So it's easy for you to think this problem is far away. It's a problem about nature. It's not going to uh, affect me directly. So that, I think, those are 10 examples, and I could give very more, of, of why from multiple different perspectives it's so uh, incredibly difficult to address the issue of, uh, of climate change and, and that's my tenth and final point, to address it in a way that's equitable, to address it in a way that doesn't lock poor countries into poverty. I talked about the green growth model not being proven, the situation is still, in a country like India, that emissions per person, emissions per capita of an Indian are about one-seventh of the emissions of an American. So if as a result of that, people in India, people in China, people in Nigeria care about economic growth and poverty eradication, how can you help them to do that without um, increasing their emissions? So that gets to a point of, um, of, of equity. 
And that, I think, is maybe related to the issue that is um, that worries me most. And, and that is, is my concern at this moment in time, that we're beginning to become active in terms of fixing the old economy. So great things are happening in Europe. Um, the new US president is talking about great things in the US. Most industrialized countries are beginning to take action to reduce emissions. But that, to me, means that we're fixing the economy of the past and maybe forgetting about the economy of the future. What do I mean by the economy of the future? There are some scenarios, and I'll mention the most extreme one. There are some scenarios that indicate that at the end of this century, one in every two humans is going to be an African. And that most of the economic growth that we can expect going forward is going to take place in Southeast Asia and in Africa. And the concern that I have is that while we're getting serious about taking action on climate change over here, we're not doing enough to help China, India, Nigeria, Mali, you name it to take their economic growth in a, in a different trajectory. So I'm afraid that we, we might be moving in the right direction in the north in terms of getting emissions down on this clock, but there's this economic and population surge set to, set to happen in the south, which could bas basically bring us to, um, to a second generation of, of the problem. So if you look at the clock, are we lost? Are we fixing the problem of the past, but not sufficiently fixing the problem of the future? And is it so complicated that we're basically not going to get this issue uh, under control? Um, my mission <laughs> this evening is not to completely depress you and to um, make sure that you have a, a, a miserable evening. But I think the things that I've mentioned are important to bear in mind. But let's turn to some things that, that are um, more positive. I, I don't know where that Glasgow conference that's happening at the moment is, is going to end, and it's set to end on Friday. But I think we're already seeing a number of, of very impressive things. We have seen that uh, a number of countries have increased their level of ambition. It may seem very far away, but for example, a country like India in announcing that it's going to be carbon neutral by by 2070 is, is quite impressive in light of everything that I've mentioned so far. Um, in Glasgow, a, a group of investors, a group of banks, a group of institutional investors that collectively hold about $130 trillion in assets have announced that they want their whole investment portfolio to be carbon neutral by 2050, which basically means that if you want to invest in a polluting activity, it's going to become increasingly difficult for you to attract the finance that you need in order to fund that, and it's going to be increasingly difficult for you to find shareholders that are willing to invest in your activity if it's moving in a, in a, polluting, uh, in a polluting direction. We've also seen an agreement in, in Glasgow, and I talked about the importance of, of methane um, and tundra, tundra melting, is an agreement to get methane emissions under control. I talked about forests at the moment emitting more than they're absorbing, emitting more CO2 than they're absorbing. 130 countries um, in Glasgow have agreed to halt deforestation by 2030. And 40 countries have agreed to phase out support for coal-fired power. And a number of industrialized countries are beginning to help major coal-powered economies like Indonesia and Vietnam to actually get them off coal and, and onto renewables. So, those are a number of, I think, very significant pledges from, uh, from countries. What we're also seeing is a growing number of, of pledges and growing engagement from the private sector. 
uh, a growing number of country companies that have committed to being carbon neutral or even net positive by, by 2050. What I find interesting in the private sector is that this is less something that the private sector is doing for humanity, but more something that the private sector is doing for itself. So the private sector is no longer so much engaging out of corporate social responsibility, out of the feeling that they have to have a positive image for society, but sustainability is beginning to make its way into the, into the core of the business model. So I see more and more companies today thinking about can I grow my business through innovation which actually helps me to address climate change and to promote sustainability. Um, for example, all the companies that used to want to sell you as much electricity as possible that are now advising you on how to save as much energy as possible. The people that want to s wanted to sell you cars in the past that are now developing rental models. So in other words, the new business models that are creating um, are being created to drive growth in the context of innovation that helps to address the climate challenge. And at the same time, more companies thinking about how can we enhance efficiency, use less energy, produce less waste, use less water, manage our supply chains better which is good for the bottom line of corporates, but at the same time helps you to address a number of these uh, global challenges. And more and more companies being aware, I think, today that how they behave is, is recognized by consumers uh, and has consequences. At the same time, the cost of technology is beginning to come down. Over the past five or six years, the cost of wind and solar technology has come down by 70%. So although we're still hugely fo subsidizing fossil fuels, we do see that wind and solar is beginning to make it into the market in, uh, in many parts of the world. And the same applies to battery technology, to en energy storage uh, technology. So the technologies of the future are beginning to make it into the market. And maybe because it is so politically difficult to take brave action on climate, act on, on climate change, that voters might not be willing to pay for. We are beginning to see climate policy making it into uh, regulation and legislation in, in many, many different ways. There are important European decisions on what you can call a green investment. We're changing the regulations in terms of what companies are expected to uh, report on. Um, Europe has a plan on the table to price products coming into the European market in terms of their carbon content. So basically companies, the private sector, and you as consumers are seeing climate action make its way into the economy in multiple different ways. Public pressure is growing in many parts of the world, and we've seen that uh, in, through the demonstrations on the, on the streets of Glasgow. Um, and I think in many parts of the world, climate change is now a critical issue in terms of elections that are taking place. So people are beginning to look at the consequences of um, the political choices that, uh, that they make. But then back to the clock, will that um, get the issue under control in time? I think there are, there are a few issues that, that we can look at in order to uh, improve our chances. The first thing which I think we need to do increasingly is to not only vote for the right people, but to hold them accountable after they have been elected. Because we see climate change making it into an election campaign, but often for forgotten about uh, afterwards. So hold the politicians accountable. The second point I think I would put forward is um, I'm in favor of people being free to make the personal choices that they want to make, you being free to make the personal choices that you want to make, providing you don't pass the cost of those choices on to me. So my second point would be, you have an important voice as a consumer, be knowledgeable in terms of what you buy and how you behave, 
And if there is something which is not very clean that you still want to do, at least pay the environmental cost of, uh, of doing that. My third point, and this goes to um, the example I gave of, of the European Union pricing products that come into the market according to their carbon content, is to be intelligent in terms of how we design policies. To design policies in such a way, not only that they discourage the wrong behavior, but that they reward and encourage the right behavior. And there are many opportunities uh, to do that. My next point, my fourth point, would be to launch a kind of Marshall Plan for the Global South. I really do not believe that we can get this issue under control unless in a much more intelligent way we help emerging economies to put their economic growth on a greener trajectory. In other words, to provide emerging economies with risk reduction capital, soft loans, grants, blended finance, basically the, the money that they need in order to, uh, to go on that greener pathway. And given the historic responsibility that we have as rich nations in terms of causing this problem, I think we also have a moral responsibility to financially be part uh, of, uh, of the solution. I think in a way that I'm, I'm confident that we, we might actually be close to, um, to a tipping point and that a political tipping point and the change can come quite suddenly and quite unexpectedly. In, and let me give an example. In the 1890s, which is quite a long time ago, in the 1890s, urban planners were afraid that the big urban challenge of the 20th century was going to be horse manure because people were becoming wealthier and everybody had horses and they had carriages and the horses were dropping things in the, in the urban centers of the world. So the big concern that that was going to be the challenge of the future. And then along came the internal combustion engine and the economy shifted suddenly. If I look at what's happening on wind, on solar, on battery technology, on hydrogen, I'm hopeful that we might be close to a tipping point in, uh, in, in a number of areas and that we might have the technology that we need to turn the corner and that much of the technology that we need today would be competitive if we removed a number of the negative subsidies, the perverse subsidies um, that I, I mentioned earlier on. So I do believe, in spite of all the negative things I've said, that there is hope. I do believe that, we've had many of, that we have many of the instruments that we need um, in hand and that we could be close to the point where we do actually manage to get this issue uh, under control. So maybe the biggest threat is complacency and we need to be courageous in, in moving forward. In that context, I want to end with a quote. I want to end with a quote from a business person. I want to end with a quote from Lord William Lever You've maybe never heard of him, um, but he was the founder of, of Unilever, which is a company I'm sure that you have heard of. And he said at the time that nothing can be greater than a business, however small, that is governed by conscience. And nothing can be meaner or more petty than a business, however large, governed without honesty and without brotherhood. Thank you. I think the mic is not where I think the Maybe because of the feedback. I'll Sorry. go over here. Ya está. Perdonar. <coughs> Tenemos un poco de tiempo para preguntas. Si hay alguna pregunta, aprovechar ahora que es un momento para preguntarle directamente. Si es en inglés directamente y si queréis, si es en castellano, voy, o no os atrevéis a lanzaros con el inglés, ya la traduzco yo. <coughs> 
No hay ninguna, rompo yo el fuego. Tengo algunas preparadas. A ver, sí, Fernando. Thank you very much for the talk. And for me, this problem is very polyedric, as you said, many things together. You are, at the end, you were talking about possible technological solutions that may come, eh, that may come suddenly. But on the other hand, you are a little bit worried also, well, not a little bit, very much worried about the third world, to say, the energy economies. Even though having technological innovations in the way you say, it's clear that we need a large amount of help to give help to the emergent economies. And do you think, do you think that nowadays the situation of the world, taking into account, for example, what is happening in the United States, that depending on the party you are, you are for or against, eh? is there a possibility unless the public pressure taking into account that we are in a real emergency actually can help anything. I don't know if, should, if I explain in a proper way. I mean, the point is that one of the messages you are giving is that we, we need to help the, the emergent economies, China, India, anywhere, eh, anywhere. But on the other hand, you are, uh, you are expecting some technological changes that could say, help things. But uh, my point is, where are you focusing more? On the change of the technologies or in the helping to the emerging uh, economies? Um, the, the Stone Age did not end because the stones were finished. The Stone Age ended because we found something better. Uh, and for me, the, the important point of the, of the mindset in, in looking at the, at the global south, the economies of the future, um, is, is not to see that as a charity case, not to see it as subsidy, but to see it as investing in the economy of, of the future. Um, I mean, I, I quoted the founder of Unilever, um, the, the man who was until recently the CEO of, of Unilever said something which I believe is very true, which is that, that business cannot succeed in a society that fails. So I think that there is a, a, a broader responsibility to invest in the economy of the future and to see a business opportunity in investing in the economy of the future, not to just see it as, uh, as a subsidy. I think that's that's part of the, of the mindset that we, that we need to, uh, to, to, to move towards. Um, it's a, a bit of an answer to the question, not all of it. There's an answer there. There are questions, Shrey. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you uh, again for, for reminding once again to us about the, the consequences of, of the climate change and that we, we, it's needed to, to take changes. And actually my, my question was about the, the concept in the beginning you, you mentioned that the scientists were not certain about the, uh, about the climate change um, in 1994, right? Uh, but actually, uh, the, the knowledge about the global warming existed uh, um, and uh, the greenhouse effect appeared uh, much more earlier. So uh, what was the click that made the scientists uh, understand and the, the society understand that there is something bigger than uh, something negative behind it? Thank yeah. you. Great question. Um, I, I think we've had for a long time, probably since the 1950s, the idea that, that greenhouse gas concentrations were increasing in the atmosphere. Um, we knew for a long time that the, the concentrations in the atmosphere 
started increasing very significantly after the Industrial Revolution. So we, we knew where the emissions were, were coming from. But we didn't know what that was going to mean. We didn't know exactly what the consequences of that uh, was, was going to be. So in, in the early days, the science of climate change was very much driven by models, especially by global circulation models, which basically tried to answer the question, if we see an increase of greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere, what is likely to be um, the impact of that in terms of climatic change? So when the Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Climate Change wrote its first assessment report in, I think, 1990, they were making estimates or guesstimates of what potentially could be the impact of greater concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So I'm finally going to have the opportunity to use this thing. Um, so in in, in 1994, or let's say 1990, um, the scientific community was basically saying, if, if we see this increase in greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere, then we're going to see the, the following consequences in terms of sea level rise, temperature increase, more extreme weather events, heating of the ocean, which leads to more mo moisture, this is what we think is going to happen if emissions uh, increase. But that's like driving a, a car, it's a bad analogy, but it's like driving a car that only has a windscreen but no rear view mirror. So these were all projections, these were all guesses by scientists and the politicians said, yeah, you're saying that but you have no evidence and you could be right or you could be wrong. Today, in 2021, what we're basically seeing is that a lot of what was projected in the models here is actually beginning to happen. So we are seeing that reality, unfortunately, is bearing out what the scientists estimated in, in the early 1990s. Um, so that has significantly increased our confidence in the message that is coming from, from the scientific community. Um, and of course, we're, we're, we're seeing that all around us. We're, we're seeing the droughts, we're seeing the extreme weather events. We know now that I think if, um, if, 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 if ocean temperature increases by one degree, then moisture content in the atmosphere increases by 7% and precipitation increases by 14%. So we're developing a much clearer understanding of, 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 of cause and effect. That's roughly it. I've got one question. <clears throat> A bit political. <laughs> uh, how can uh, the United Nations make uh, or um, uh, yeah, try to, to make sure that the countries are going to fulfill the, the commitments that they are signing in the COP26? Is there any way that United Nations can make to, to make this like a, a global commitment so that, I mean, we are not put, going to put a, an army into, into a country that is not fulfilling the, their, their commitments. But if, is there any, any way that the United Nations can make to make these commitments come to a reality? Um, I think the United Nations can do a number of important things. I mean, the, the UN can create a platform for dialogue. Um, secondly, Something I think we often forget is that we've invested hugely in, in an international architecture that was actually created to help countries find a better future. 
So if you look at the, the UN, the Bretton Woods institutions, you, you have the, the UN with the UN Development Program and a World Food Program. Um, you have the International Monetary Fund, you have the World Bank, you have the regional development banks. So there is a, a huge arc, international architecture under the, the UN in a broader definition, which, we, which I think we could be using much more effectively to help countries um, to, towards uh, solutions. And then I think that the UN has a very important role to play in terms of holding up a mirror to humanity, and we're seeing that happen on television now with the, with the Glasgow conference, to hold a, min a mirror up to society and say that we're not doing enough at the moment. Countries are not living up um, to their pledges. And in the run-up to this conference in Glasgow, the, the scientific community which falls under the UN, the Intergovernmental on Panel on Climate Change, came with a report on the latest understanding of the science, and the UN came with a report that outlined exactly where countries' action is in terms of, of what they promised and, and what the gap is. And other parts of, of the international architecture um, tell us exactly which pathways we need to be following if we want to achieve change. So the, the UN can't shoot the politicians or put them in jail, but it, it can provide, I think, an important platform um, for, for accountability and for assistance. I was thinking in the example of Mr. Trump. <laughs> well, yeah. What can we do if we, if we have something, so, again, someone like this kind of people that, so, with such an influence? Well, I'm not sure that the, the, the problem is entirely Trump. Um, I mean, 70% of Americans believe that climate change is real. But only 45% of Americans believe that we are the cause of that real climate change. 55% think it's a natural phenomenon. So the majority of Americans, not just Trump, but the majority of the Americans don't actually believe this story. And that's what I meant right at the beginning about, about looking at, at the world through a, a European lens. I think most Europeans, and you raised your hands, are convinced that this is incredibly important. But there are people in some very big countries who don't believe this issue are real. And there are people in other countries who feel that it's more important to get food on the table than it is to reduce emissions. So we, we still have a ways to go. There's one question there. <clears throat> My question is not uh, totally related to, to climate change, but imagine that uh, we, are, we manage to, to use all the energy produced by renewable sources. Can we continue uh, with this standard of living based on, let's say, all these industries, most of, a lot of them highly polluted? I mean, the pollution we are created, no, 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 not only CO2, but there are much more, uh, water, earth, and, and everything. And my question is, although we imagine that we, we are able to control the, the, the CO2 emissions, but uh, could we continue with this, with, with all this kind of, all this type of industries and everything? I don't, I don't think so. Um, another challenge for the interpreter, but I, I think we have issues around Climate change, energy prices, energy security, food security, water security, material scarcity, um, biodiversity loss, deforestation, driven by wealth increase, population increase, and urbanization. So we have a broader set of, of sustainability uh, related issues. That may sound depressing, but the, the hope that I, I take from that is that, that many of those issues are interrelated. So, for example, there's a, a very close relationship between uh, climate, energy, food, and water. Um, for example, do you know how much water you need to produce one kilogram of beef? Uh, 
10,000 liters of water. So in other words, I think we will be under pressure to, to look at these issues in a, in a much more integrated way than we've done in the past. And, and my hope would be that um, you know, another challenge that we face is that in the next 20 years we need to produce 30% more food globally in order to accommodate population increase. That we will over time begin to look at issues together in a, in a more integrated way and find solutions that are not just good for climate change but for some of the other challenges as, as well. And if we don't, and I think that's what your question points to, then I think we're in big trouble on, uh, on, on other fronts. Good, we're warming up now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have another question. Um, it's related to your last sentence where you said like uh, about honesty related to, to people, companies, etc. And it's related to two aspects. One is the political aspect, the other one is the economical aspect. Well, on the one hand, we saw how uh, certain commitments were made in 2015 in the conference in Paris. But unfortunately, according to, to the last information, many countries are not fulfilling those commitments. And now we are in 2021 and we are making more commitments. Do you really think that they are going to be fulfilled? And on the other hand, you said that like, many companies Many fans have been um, focusing in, in green industry and improving the, the future, trying to, to produce less or emit less carbon dioxide. Do you really think that there are all, those are honest things or they are also trying to, I heard the other day, the greenwashing themselves as trying to, to sell as they are green, but really it's not like a, a grill uh, economy that they are building, or not as efficient as it could be? Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's both. Um, but the, the reason I ended with the quote from a business person is because I think that when I was in my 30s, which is a long time ago, <laughs> business people felt that their only responsibility was to make a profit, full stop. Um, and I think there is a growing sense on the part of the business community that, that business cannot succeed in a society that fails, that business has a, res a broader responsibility. Um, secondly, I, have, I believe that our definition of value is, is changing. Um, that whereas the value of a company only used to be expressed in cash, in cash return to shareholders, there is now a recognition that much of the value of companies is actually locked up in things that we used to call non-financial. So the intellectual capital that you create, the network capital that you create, the manufactured capital that you uh, create, the natural capital that you create. So how the value of a company is, is perceived is beginning to change. And if the investors that hold the 130 trillion that I talked about earlier on are saying we are going to hold you accountable in a different way in the future I think that that will uh, I think that that will drive change I also believe that that new business models will occur or emerge as new markets develop um, I keep mentioning Unilever, but for example, Unilever a number of years ago saw a big future in the South. So they started making products which were more targeted to poor people and the challenges of poor people. So for example, pr producing washing powder that you don't need to mix with any water uh, and selling it in very small packets. So I think we're, we're beginning to see a, a, a number of, of, of shifts there and that new opportunities will emerge. But I think we're broadly still in the situation where some very important political economic players are holding us back and that it's the, the smaller, the more unproven, the more innovative, the younger companies that are not yet sufficiently succeeding in, uh, in, in, in pushing us forward. But I do think change will come and things has, change has always come. Uh, Fernando was telling me that there used to be shipbuilding yards in, 
in, in, in the river here in, in Bilbao, economies change. Any more questions in the audience? Preguntas? A una más? Shall we continue last one or is it enough? <laughs> You're the boss. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's an opportunity having you here to make. One yeah, we've road. got one question yeah. there. I knew that we were going to have more. Uh, thank you for your very nice talk. Um, uh, I'd like to ask, um, other than uh, reducing the emissions and trying to uh, have some technologies that uh, emit less uh, gases, uh, is there any opportunity also for businesses or some models to uh, absorb the gases that uh, are released and instead of uh, in order to compensate for uh, yeah, the emissions that we do. Yeah. Um, there are a number of, of, of companies and a, a number of politicians, including a number of fossil fuel companies, who believe in carbon capture and storage. So the idea there is that you, you capture the CO2 out of a, a power plant or out of a factory, um, that you pressurize it and that you store it somewhere on the ocean floor or in an empty gas field or, uh, or in an empty mine. Um, maybe because I come from a largely Protestant company, a country, I think that's a very end of pipe technology. It's, it's, it, it doesn't fix the root cause of the problem. It doesn't really change the behavior. It does something at the exhaust rather than changing, uh, changing the principle. Plus carbon capture and storage today is, is still extremely expensive. It costs generally about $150 to take a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere and you can avoid a ton of CO2 much more cheaply with, with wind and with solar. Um, so I think carbon capture and storage might work in, in certain places. For example, if you use fossil fuels to make hydrogen, which is a clean energy source, and then pump the CO2 under the ground. But I don't think it can be a solution on, on a large scale. Um, what I do think can happen is, is capturing more, um, more CO2 in forests. Um, I think there are agriculture accounts for agriculture and land use accounts for about 25% of all of our emissions, and there are a lot of things, that, good things that we can do in terms of agricultural practices to reduce emissions. So maybe the mix of carbon capture and storage, more forests, better agricultural practices can can help. Um, and then there are some people. I don't know if they're on drugs or not, but there are some people talking about really interesting technologies of, of, of blasting CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is um, a bit beyond my intelligence. Last question, because we, we have to leave at eight, right? So thank you, Javi. Yes, just a, a, a question about what is your opinion about, at the personal level, citizens, particularly in Europe, but not only in Europe, we are used, we are convinced that the um, progression of the, the progress is continuous and endless. So the, 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 our economical system relies on a paradigm of continuous growth, and our life is going to uh, be better every generation onwards. Uh, without any limit, because the economical theory at the moment is a theory which is with an, end, an endless growth. And with this issue of the climate change and some others, uh, I think it should be posed that this paradigm should be changed, and probably we have to 
not only stop growing in our welfare, but probably to reduce our welfare personally, because in the future, if we are leaving more and more persons, we have to, to consider that probably our, our state of uh, how do we spend, how, we, how much do we travel, how much beef we eat, how, ma how many clothes we buy, should be reduced or controlled at, uh, to a center, certain extent if we want to continue so having a viable and sustainable society. And I think uh, little effort is being made in this point to tell people that this also has to be taken into account. That's, what is your opinion about it? Well, my opinion is that you're right. Um, the, 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 the challenge is, is how you do it. Uh, I mean, I mentioned that I come from a largely Protestant country. I, I, I worked for a minister for a while um, who went on television and said that people should take shorter showers. And she was completely ridiculed in, uh, in the media. So I, I think you have to be very careful on, in, in terms of how you talk to people about behavioral change. Um, there's a, there's a, 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 a curve that, oh dear, this is the wrong marker. <laughs> I've destroyed your board, Fernando, I'm sorry. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a curve that, that, that plots um, the relationship between level of income and um, sense of well-being. And there is a point, for, for a lot of the journey, more money contributes to a greater sense of well-being but you reach a point where more money actually makes you less happy. The only people that have reached that point are the Germans. Nobody else is there yet. And a lot of the people in the developing countries that I talked about are, are, are here. They still want to get their car, their television, their fridge, et, et, et cetera. So it's, I think it's a challenge. What, what I do sense, and certainly in, in, in our part of the world, that our definition of, of happiness and our definition of prosperity is, is beginning to change, that we are beginning to, to, to value different things, um, that we are beginning to recognize that we can actually be very happy with less, that we don't need two or three cars, that you don't need a big car, that you don't need 12 suits, that you know, I, th I think that change is happening, but I think that change is happening in, in, in our part of the world. Um, and the bit that worries me, and I try to talk about that, is, is all those people um, who, who are, still, are still here. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a big challenge. I think part of the, the challenge is to, or part of the solution to the challenge is to, is to confront people much more openly with the consequences of the choices that they, that they make. Um, to not say to people, you can't drive a big car or you can't take a flying holiday, but to say, if you want to take a flying holiday, fine, but you are going to pay for the cost of that pollution. You're not going to pass it on uh, to me. So it's a, it's a difficult issue. It's a, a culturally, a politically, a very sensitive issue. Uh, we still have a very long way to go, sadly. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, you. And I think now we have to close. It's already 8 o'clock and we need to finish now. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.